Welcome to the Elijah Rising podcast. Elijah Rising is an organization empowering women recovering from sexual exploitation. This episode is going to help you become more aware about the issue of sex trafficking and inspire you to take action. Welcome back to the Elijah Rising podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about familial trafficking and the work that an amazing organization called Hands of Justice is doing to combat both it and other forms of trafficking. Today, I'm joined by Carrie. She's a lead advocate with Hands of Justice. And why don't you tell us a little bit about um, what Hands of Justice does? So at Hands of Justice, we kind of like to bridge that gap between people who, between what people like to think of as residential care and for people who are just trying, because residential care is great. We Mm -hmm. obviously Mm -hmm. um, think organizations that have residential care are amazing. We partner with um, four different organizations in the area, but a lot of people, unless they're willing to give up their jobs and Mm -hmm. their homes, and if they have a spouse or children or a pet, they can't go into residential Mm -hmm. care. So we offer economic empowerment and Mm -hmm. support services for um, survivors, both male and female, who are just trying to get through life. That's amazing. You guys do so much. And I hope that we'll unpack that a little bit uh, more as we go through. But the piece that you guys bring to the table is so needed. Um, And it's just such a gift to the city. Um, So many people um, who aren't, don't have an understanding of um, human trafficking think that one of the main reason people relapse is um, drugs. Mm -hmm. And they think, oh, the number one reason why people relapse is drugs. Um, at Hands of Justice, we firmly believe that the number one reason people relapse is lack of economic empowerment. Mm. They get out of the life. They have no skills. They have oftentimes have no documents mm-hmm. and they have an, don't have the ability to get a job and support themselves. And so we try to kind of come in and fill that gap. We have a dignity boutique where people mm-hmm. can come and receive free clothing and toiletry items mm-hmm. to help with just a lot of times um, people escape with the clothes on their back. Yeah. But also if they need something for interviewing mm-hmm. or need clothes for a job Mm -hmm. we offer that to people we have um a myriad of different support groups for both men and women we have support groups in the evening we are starting a support group during the days for our thought processes that maybe somebody might need it during their lunch hour and they don't have the ability to log in at night Mm -hmm. and do a support group if they have small kids Mm -hmm. or so we're starting that we have um support group for men as well and we partner with four different organizations in um in the area and who are safe houses Mm -hmm. and we offer support group services to them as well as people who are just living their lives and need support and encouragement. Yeah. Um, I personally um, lead three of those and then we have other people that lead the other ones as well that are amazing at it. Mm -hmm. And um, it's one of my, it is the favorite, my favorite part about my job is leading those support groups and getting to work one-on-one with survivors and help them to become overcomers. Amazing. Well, so how, tell us a little bit about how you got involved with Hands of Justice. Okay. I love to tell the story. It's one of my favorite stories of all time because I get to brag on God a little mm-hmm. bit. So I was drawn to work with two different anti-trafficking organizations years before I ever um, self-identified as a trafficking victim. Wow. God just put them on my on my heart to to start volunteering i uh, met uh, a few women and god just gave me this tremendous amount of love for them Mm -hmm. and i wanted to pour into their lives so i was volunteering on a a pretty consistent and regular basis and one of those women that i met um she was in a safe house when i met her asked me to be her plus one Mm -hmm. at a hands of justice um fundraising event Mm -hmm. and so i went to the event to support her however i was sitting at the table that was full of the speakers and the overcomers wow and throughout the night people from the stage would point at our table and they would say these amazing overcomers Mm -hmm. i they're so brave and they're so strong and they would just brag on everybody at the table and i immediately got annoyed by that Mm -hmm. i just was so annoyed and so uncomfortable in my skin and i'm sitting there and i'm smiling and then i asked myself the question i was like god why is this bothering me so much Mm -hmm. like why am i getting annoyed by that because i kept saying to myself I'm just a victim of childhood SA. I'm not a victim of trafficking. Yeah. And so I just sat there in that at the gala at the table and I asked God, mm. why is this annoying me so much? Yeah. And I 
So I self-identified as a trafficking victim at a Hands of Justice event. Wow. That night, I called my friend um, and said, I believe that I was trafficked. Mm. And she gave me um, Becca, our founder's mm. phone number. Becca, I called Becca. She answered. And um, she got me connected with a support group. Mm -hmm. And that is how I first got introduced to Hands of Justice was at wow. their event. <laughs> I self-identified there. And then I got plugged into a support group. I lead that very support group now that I once participated in as a um, survivor. Wow. And I get goosebumps every time I tell this story and I have them now. And I've told this story so many times because like I said, I love to be able to brag on God and what he did for me. But he built me a support structure mm -hmm. before I ever knew I would need it. Yeah. And I had this ironclad support structure mm -hmm. of people who themselves had been trafficked, who I'd been pouring into, mm -hmm. who I loved with this godly love. And I had um, organizations that were willing to support mm -hmm. me and help me along my healing journey. So as I grew in my healing my role in Hands of Justice grew as well. And I started out as the substitute group leader mm -hmm. to the group that I attended mm -hmm. and then to one other one as well. And then after a while, then I just became group leader. Mm -hmm. And then it, as things progressed along and the heal, more and more healing happened, I ended up being an assistant advocate. And now my title is technically lead advocate, but I don't like to be like, mm -hmm. I'm the lead. <laughs> that's not what that's about. Yeah. And so now... Um, I get to um, offer advocacy services yeah. to survivors as well as lead these support groups. Incredible. What an incredible story. I actually have never heard that. So I'm like blown away. Yeah. And I think that goes to show even to our listeners, you know, I think sometimes in this field, we think, oh, everyone's heard about trafficking or mm -hmm. everyone understands, you know, mm -hmm. and there's so many, the vast majority of people actually do not understand. They don't. Yeah. They so don't understand. the importance of um, awareness mm -hmm. and then for people just like yourself who have a lived experience mm -hmm. and going, wait a minute, wait a minute, that's me, you yes. know, and Almost every time I speak, someone in the audience self identifies yeah. as as a victim of trafficking. Yeah, and I think that that for the everyone that comes forward and says, "Oh my gosh, I just really," there's people in the audience that aren't coming forward sure. because they don't feel free to do that. Yeah, um, specific specifically, um, I've only met very few. Um, victims of familial trafficking that are willing to speak out yeah. because of just the dynamics with the family and yeah. um, all the guilt and shame and fear that yeah. goes into that so that God has given me this level of freedom mm -hmm. and um, to be able to speak mm -hmm. and to be able to speak without fear, without mm -hmm. um, shame or self-loathing, I yeah. think is just my honor and my privilege to be able to pour into others. And um, my life verse is Isaiah 61, three, and it's like, it talks about beauty for ashes mm. and this is my beauty for ashes every single day that's amazing that i get to pour into other overcomers and help them along their healing journey yeah you're like a beacon like come this way right you're like uh, casting the light and so can you you mentioned familial trafficking mm -hmm. you know it's something that i think a lot of people either aren't familiar with mm -hmm. that term understand what it means or and or even don't believe that it happens in the United States. Mm -hmm. Would you mind unpacking that for us a little bit? I would love to. So familial trafficking as like a definition mm -hmm. is the exploitation of a child at the hands of their family, either through labor trafficking mm -hmm. or sex trafficking. So if you think of a child in a sweatshop in Indonesia, mm -hmm. that's a form of familial trafficking. Mm -hmm. Their parents have sold them to this sweatshop. Everybody's familiar with that kind of idea mm -hmm. of trafficking. Mm -hmm. We, um, Oftentimes in America, we think of familial trafficking as something that might happen overseas where parents might feel they're forced to sell one of their children um, to sex trafficking in order to support the rest of the family. Yeah. But what I've discovered in my work and as I might speak is that people do not think familial trafficking is something that happens here in the United States. Correct. Yeah. And they are very uncomfortable mm -hmm. with the idea that it's happening in every city and every town in the United States of America. It's happening. Yeah. And I think people like to kind of put up a blinder when it comes, oh, that, that doesn't happen here. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's why I feel that it's so important for me to speak whenever God gives me opportunity because I can tell people it does happen here. Yeah. It happened to me and um, it happened to my sister as well. And um, 
it's happening all around you. And, yeah. and at no point in my childhood or adolescence did anyone, a teacher, a counselor, wow. anyone recognize what was going on with mm. me and help. And I exhibited every single trauma response you would expect a child to exhibit yeah. if they're being trafficked at such an early age and nobody helped mm. nobody mm. so whatever i can do to raise awareness mm -hmm. to speak because um sometimes i think of it like this have you ever had a family member or somebody you know that had a health issue but they don't want to go to the doctor because they don't want to know mm -hmm. they're like if i go to the doctor then it becomes real right and so i'm not going to go to the doctor i'm just going to suffer and deal mm -hmm. i feel like a lot of people act that way when it comes to um trafficking yeah if i don't know about it so true if i don't educate <laughs> myself on it yeah. then it's not real and i don't mm -hmm. have to worry about that as much because that happens to other people right and so i get to be that mirror and hold it up and show people like this is happening yeah. this is happening and just because you might just like if you ignore a tumor it's not going to go away yeah. just if you ignore trafficking it's it doesn't mean it's going to go away yeah. and it doesn't mean that your family members or yourself are exempt from it right it just means that you're all the more likely to maybe end up a prey or a victim or your mm. family member because you're not educating yourself to the dangers yeah yeah and I think it's taken so um, there's so, there's so much nuance with familial trafficking, mm -hmm. you know, and you mentioned, you know, the signs and the, the exhibiting behaviors. Mm -hmm. Do you mind touching on that just a little bit? I'm thinking for our listeners, maybe who are like teachers or, mm -hmm. you know, in places where there are kids around. But even if you're not in that position, mm -hmm. if you have children or teenagers and they have friends and they come over i mean these are things that we can be educated to watch out for them as well exactly you know? i think it's very hard for people to look at a child and ask themselves is this child exhibiting signs of ptsd or yeah. complex ptsd yeah. because they don't want to think that way they, so for me i um just to give a little context um I was trafficked at the uh, beginning at the age of three. Mm -hmm. My sister was born with a birth defect in her eyes and my parents needed money for surgery. Mm -hmm. And I earned the money for that surgery. And that is when my trafficking journey began at three. Wow. Um, so people don't want to look at a three-year-old and or a five-year-old. So for me, one of the main things was is I was incredibly disconnected from my body mm -hmm. because I just compartmentalized. Mm -hmm. So I was very awkward mm -hmm. and very um, things that were easy for other people to do, like in gym class. Mm -hmm. I physically like couldn't do them. Mm -hmm. I did not know how to move the way everybody else moved. I couldn't. So I was very disconnected from my body. It was incredibly anxious mm -hmm. at a very early age. Yeah. Um, also like I was, you know, um, forced to, it, I wasn't, it wasn't once the sex trafficking ended for me, then after that point, I was forced to like earn my keep through like doing all of the cooking, all of the, I started cooking dinner at eight years old mm. for the family, wow. like, um, had to make a menu, a grocery list, all of the wow. things. So then, so the, the, all of that fear and that trauma, it just continued on of like, did I hang their shirts up the right way? Yeah. Did I, did, is there any like grit left in the sink from mm. cleaning the sink? Am I going to get beat for that? So the anxiety that I felt even after the trafficking started mm. was incredibly apparent. I was yeah. incredibly anxious child but nobody helped Picked and nobody it, cared yeah. and um and so i didn't act out in the traditional ways that people mm. think through because again i was three yeah so yeah. i'm not going to go this out and drink or use drugs or mm. do any of the things that yeah. you would perceive as typical mm -hmm. acting out behavior because mm -hmm. I didn't have that ability to do that but I was incredibly disassociative mm -hmm. I could disassociate at the drop of a hat um I loved to read and just lose myself. I still do. Mm -hmm. um, it's the only socially approved form of disassociation <laughs> is reading. Um, and so I would just, I would just check out yeah. and I would be gone. Yeah. Um, and I exhibited signs of ADHD, but mm -hmm. it was really um, the symptoms of PTSD. Yeah. Interesting. And so often, if you look at just on paper, the signs of ADHD in a child and the signs of a complex PTSD in a child, a lot of those are overlap. Mm -hmm. And so we'll 
be so quick to believe, oh, my sure. child has, or this child, yeah. a teacher, an educator, this child has ADHD. Mm-hmm. Let's get them medicated. It's going to fix it. Right. Um, instead of thinking, okay, could this be a trauma response? Mm-hmm. It could be ADHD, but yeah. it also could be a trauma response. Man. And as educators and um, school counselors, daycare workers, yep. you may be the only people yep. that this child ever sees. I went to school. Yeah. Um, you know, I participated in extracurricular activities because I had to appear to be normal yeah yeah and so there were opportunities but there was just nobody who was willing to look past my quote-unquote problems to see what the root cause might have been yeah that was you bring up a really interesting point because um you know kid children who are familial trafficked are vast majority are going to school they're going to church even they're Mm -hmm. traveling they're doing some quote-unquote like normal things Mm -hmm. um but maybe you know, behind closed doors, things are are not as they seem. And so mm-hmm. um, I think that's another misconception that we can break down for people because mm-hmm. you think, oh, well, they're just at a hotel room or they're like locked away somewhere. Yes. That's not the case at all. They're all around us. Right. Yeah. Um, so statistically, uh, across the board, children and adults, um, only 2% of people who are trafficked are kidnapped. Mm-hmm. So that applies to children as well yeah. as adults. So people like to have this image of, oh, if my child's not kidnapped, mm-hmm. they're not going to be trafficked. This isn't something I have to worry about. Yeah. But if there's an uncle or an aunt who takes them for long periods of time, if there's a neighbor that babysits and cares for them, mm-hmm. it can be happening to your child. Mm-hmm. And so um, that level of awareness nobody wants to think that yeah nobody wants to sit there and think is my child you don't want to make your child be afraid yeah, you don't want right. to cross that but at the same time um because nobody likes to think that it it's it's a leading contributor to the to children being exploited mm-hmm. and not getting help that they need yeah a, like long term totally i we've done so many outreaches where you know um a young girl will come into the hotel room and we meet with her and talk with her um and she's like, oh, well, I have to get back to class tomorrow mm-hmm. or, you know, my uncle's waiting for me. I mean, just the craziest scenarios. And you're like, oh, my, this is right here. And it's mm-hmm. really is all around us and our neighborhoods. And like you said, daycares, all of these things. Would you mind sharing a little bit more about what Hands of Justice does? There is so much that you guys are doing and you have such a amazing team working alongside survivors. Um, but you mentioned that you have support groups for men. I mean, I know I could go on and on right but um let's just start there so what does that look like and i do want to stress that there's only four of us on staff so we are a very small organization Mm -hmm. so while my role may be lead advocate Mm -hmm. we do whatever needs to get done sure (laughs) many hats we do we wear a lot of hats um so support groups are my favorite part of Mm -hmm. what i get to do um i personally get to lead three and then we have um support groups for men Mm -hmm. um we have a daytime support group as well and then we have have a support group for family members of trafficking wow. victims. Yeah. And so we try to be very holistic in our approach to this because trafficking affects the entire family. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, 30% of trafficking victims are male mm. and we are one of the few organizations that offer services to men. Um, they are completely separate from our services to, to women mm-hmm. because for obvious reasons, we don't want there to be any re-traumatization or sure. issues. Um, so we partner with in our support groups Um, with four um, organizations in the Houston area who have safe homes Mm -hmm. and I get to lead support groups with them and then we also have support groups for people much like myself when I needed that support group when I first Mm self-identified who were living their lives but need that support and that structure so we will get together via Zoom and so they're open nationwide Mm -hmm. Um, we get together there'll be a topic for the week but oftentimes um, I might have a great topic in mind and then somebody will need help with a certain thing. Sure. So like God just gives me strength to pivot. Yeah. And we just um, we just lean into one another. We mm-hmm. support one another wherever we may be in our mm-hmm. walk. We'll have people who've been out of the life for a very, very long time. Mm-hmm. And then we'll have people who are fresh out of the life in these support groups. Um, and so we just... Um, support one another and encourage one another to keep going yeah and it's very much a judgment-free zone which is very very important Mm -hmm. um for me the first time i came to a support group um it felt very much like when you would walk into like 
a church for the first time and feel like everybody's like minded or mm. um if you if you do some sort of like crocheting or yeah. knitting or pottery or whatever when you would go to like an event and everybody there is like you yeah. and everybody has the same kind of interests as you yeah. for me it felt very much like oh okay everybody yeah. here is like me and they get it yeah and they understand yeah and so our traumas may be very different sure. um mine started at a very young age mm-hmm. and ended um at a young age but trauma is trauma yeah. and so we um we just it's the this the pillar of what we do at hands of justice mm-hmm. after that point after support groups we have our advocacy services mm-hmm. scholarships ged training like i said um and then we try to have outings um, periodically throughout the year mm-hmm. where people from the different organizations mm-hmm. and the support groups can all get together. Mm-hmm. And I have to tell you, these are some of the most beautiful times. Our Christmas party is always one of the most encouraging and beautiful times of the year because you might have um, people my age who've been trafficked and all the way down to maybe teenagers yeah, at well. these places. And so for everybody to see like we're all doing, we're all right. living life. We're all walking towards healing. We're all doing the work that needs to be done. And mm. it's just such an encouragement to be in a big space that's full of overcomers. Amazing. And it, we hear stories afterwards, like that blessed me so much. So, and so when she said that it was such a blessing to me and it resonated with me mm-hmm. um these these type of things are just so very important for overcomers because we um you know with ptsd and especially complex ptsd comes hypervigilance yep. um not yep. having felt safety not having and so to walk into a space where yeah. everybody is the same and we're well, nobody's going to judge you yeah. for for keeping your head on the swivel and making yeah. sure you're and we're all just going to be there together yeah. and um and support one another it's just it's it's we get to comfort others with the comfort we've been given of god yeah, and that's to me absolutely. is let's take a quick break join us at the abolition summit in atlanta georgia at gate city church from july 24 through 26. this impactful gathering is going to bring together like-minded leaders from across the u.s to experience God's presence and reignite our mission to abolish human trafficking. Come join us, reconnect with the one who called you to this work. We are really calling on frontline workers, people that are praying for the ending of human trafficking. There's a place at the table for you at this conference. You can find information at abolitionsummit.com. amazing and beautiful and i it's hard Mm -hmm. it's exhausting Mm -hmm. but it's the best part of my job and i love it so much it's so important because i think that trauma isolates Mm -hmm. um whether you've lost a loved one or like you know you've been through something that you've been through like trauma is isolating you don't feel not everyone gets it not everyone gets it not everyone has been through it and it's it's something that if you can be in a room or on Zoom, right, mm-hmm. with um, with other people who have the same kind of experiences as you, you don't have to explain yourself, you don't have to defend yourself, you know, you, mm-hmm. none of that, all that goes away. And if it seems like it would be a place where survivors can truly kind of relax, yes. be themselves, um, yeah, it's just incredible what you guys are doing and that you have support groups for men mm-hmm. is so unique. And then for the family as well, I can just see how powerful that would be. Right. Because, you know, only 1% of people traffic ever make it out. So mm-hmm. for for like, so I'm sitting here representing like for me being out, there's 99 yeah. people behind me that never do. Yeah. Well, those are people, 99 people with families yeah, and they need support and they need um, to to be with somebody that can and they go oh you too you know right oh you oh you do that too you worry too you do all Mm -hmm. of that it's just so validating and it's something um you know that's just a beautiful thing to come out of a tragedy of your child being in the life to be able to have people that support you Mm -hmm. and come beside you and you can form bonds with Mm -hmm. it's an amazing thing and it's so needed and 
um, we are one of the few organizations that does have the services for men, mm. like you said, but also the family as well. Yeah. And it's incredible. Just very important. Yeah. And I want to touch on another thing really quick. So we, you know, you mentioned that you work with all mm-hmm. the safe homes in the city, of which there are four, there are four. right? <laughs> not very many. There are not. <laughs> Even in a big city, you know. Um, so that has been a real blessing, I know, to Elijah Rising, I'm sure to the others, so we can have mm-hmm. a safe space where the residents in our care can meet up with other survivors and say, like, okay, I'm not alone. I'm not a mm-hmm. weirdo, right? Because I'm in this home or in this program. Mm-hmm. There's other people who are at different stages of life. And not only that, but they're down the road, maybe mm-hmm. from where I want to be. And so that's like an, that's something to aspire to, you exactly. know, and they're not with our staff, right? Because right. I'm sure they get tired of our staff all the time. So it's just such a win, a win for us. And I hope it's a win for you guys. But we've been so blessed by those support groups. And I know others have been too, you know, it's I, again, I love it. And um, I do think that I obviously we come aside, we partner with <laughs> um, safe homes and residential um care facilities but i think that when you're in the same place with the same people day in and day out you tend to get this kind of myopic Mm -hmm. and this slightly jaded view on things Mm -hmm. and so just to be able to have an outlet and be able to talk to somebody that you don't talk to every day or sees and i don't know what's going on in the house i get to just have fresh ears Mm -hmm. and hold space for them and what they're what they're going through and i think it's just um it's for me and I hope for them, it's a beautiful thing mm. to be able to offer them a outlet that's yeah. outside of what their day in day out life is. Yeah. Because when you're with, you know, when you, when you're in these programs and you're not locked in, but you're, you know, you're ha- go, yeah, the, you're committed. Yes, you're kind you of work in to, the program. Yes. It's yeah. just becomes very like little things. Um, get blown up into big things and but then when you communicate it yeah to, to somebody you're like wait <laughs> now that i okay, say it out loud and, and to <laughs> right. somebody who's not in the house with right me, maybe that wasn't that big of a right, deal after right. all but when you're in the house it's kind yeah. of like a pressure cooker yeah in these homes yeah. and so like i get to be that steam valve yeah. and where they can just let off mm-hmm. the pressure a little bit and then they can go back and then uh, for a week and then they get to come back yeah. to me let off a little pressure of what's going on in their day-to-day lives yeah. and then go f- so i I get to be a small part mm-hmm. um, of what their healing journey is. Yeah. And I, I'm grateful for that. That's huge. You know, and um, it is such a, an interesting niche because, you know, I think even in the movement, we think, oh, there, there's so much healing. There's so much restorative work that needs to be done. A safe home is the answer. Mm-hmm. But to your point, it's not always the answer for everybody. Mm-hmm. Not everyone can, you know, have the time or the space to do that. A lot of many, many people, women have children. Mm-hmm. So that's the number one reason nationwide that women get rejected from programs yes. because they have children in their care and they mm-hmm. can't just you know, drop them off with Nana or whatever, whatever. Mm-hmm. they don't have that luxury. And so, um, you know, it's, it really is a unique niche that you guys have to serve mm-hmm. kind of that in between place where survivors are trying to rebuild, trying to heal, but also having to manage just day to day things. So is there like a success story that you might want to share with our listeners? Um, Yes, I love getting asked that. Um, So I'm going to share one from about group and then one from so... Um, as I said, I've recently gotten the privilege of having the Elijah Rising ladies mm-hmm. um, join me for support group. And they um, are also in group with um, ladies from another organization as well. And it's so interesting to me because when the ladies are by themselves, they might be complaining. They might be telling me everything that's gone wrong that week. But when the two organizations come together, it creates this environment where um, one person may share and then the other the ladies from the other organization are speaking life to them mm. and encouraging them so and good. I just kind of get to sit back yeah. for a minute and then the other organization will do the same thing mm. as well and so they are um, encouraging and supporting mm. one another wow. in these support groups um, and to, I, I'm sorry, I'm getting emotional about no, it because it's this beautiful thing yeah, yeah. because it's showing that, A, their healing is progressing. Mm-hmm. They're having like a clear thoughts and yes. understanding and then they're wanting to pour into people like themselves. Yeah. And so for me, it's such an encouragement mm-hmm. that um, that the groups are working. Yeah. That, and so I... 
I love that. And mm. um, whenever they do that, they'll be like, oh, I felt like that. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to leave and I wanted to throw away everything. Yeah. But I didn't. I, I This is what worked for me. And this is and this. It's just huge because I also think that it's huge for me to witness. But I think for the person that's getting to speak life and encourage someone, mm-hmm. they've never gotten to be a role model before. Right. They've been more of a cautionary tale, yeah. not something to aspire to. Mm-hmm. So when they get to speak to other women and encourage them with um, things that have worked for them, yeah. it's huge. And yeah. it, it can really be life altering because mm-hmm. they're like, oh, wait, I do have something worthwhile to say. Um, I do have something that is actually healing and that yeah. will work. Yeah. And so I love, I love that. Um, and it's so beautiful. And um, I have an independent client that um, we're just so very proud of. I'm not going to mm-hmm. go into too many of her sure. personal details, but a little over a year ago, she was like 87 pounds. Mm-hmm. She's walking with a cane. Um, she wow. was um, had relapsed back into the life and mm-hmm. into drugs, and we were worried we were going to lose her. Mm-hmm. We genuinely were concerned that she was going to die in the yeah. life. She um, has type 1 diabetes mm-hmm. and had had several strokes. Wow. And so she was, we believed, like, yeah. uh, she's going to die in the life this time. Yeah. Um, because on average, it takes seven tries to get out. And so she, um, almost a year ago, she got out of the life she got off the drugs she is so clear-headed now Mm. and is so grateful her favorite thing in life is every sunday she gets to go to the grocery store and she gets to buy the groceries that she's going to eat that Mm. week and she gets to eat what she wants Mm. because she was starved in the life and food was used as control and her absolute joy in life excited jumping up and down the way some people might jump up and down because they're going to see taylor swift or something (laughs) else she is so excited to go to the grocery store and it's beautiful and so she is going to be winning an award from a small organization organization up in Dallas called Lost Lilies Mm -hmm. and um, it's a very small organization they just want to get together once a year and bless an overcomer Mm -hmm. and encourage them um, to keep on fighting the good fight and so we'll be taking her up to Dallas in June and um, and then she will have her year freedom date and her year sober in July wow that's huge and so it's amazing to see um, it's amazing that she's alive because one percent of us make it out but it's also amazing to just get to hear how clear she is now Mm -hmm. the understanding that she has Mm -hmm. about what happened to her um and everything else and her story is particularly poignant um because she was born in the life she was Mm -hmm. born to um a drug addicted mother in the life and then that perpetuated and now she's breaking that cycle and she's uh, she is like setting Mm. that boundary and she's stopping that cycle in her life and um she encourages all of us yeah and um when we might be struggling where we're like oh but this one she's yeah. doing so good yeah. and we thought we were gonna lose her yeah we thought she was gonna die yeah. and she's here and she's clear-headed and she's she's not just sober but she's sober-minded as right. well and she recently got baptized wow and it's such and she says that she feels completely mm. different and she oh can goodness. feel a difference this time wow. and it's just the power of god yeah and what he can do yeah um and so we're i'm so very grateful to get to just come alongside her on yeah. her healing journey and support and encourage and love her. That's incredible. Carrie, you guys are doing such phenomenal work. I mean, we can sit here all day, I think, and share stories and testimonies. <laughs> and I would love to do that one <laughs> sometime. Um, is there anything else before we sign off for our listeners that we haven't touched on that you think it's important for them to know? Okay. I, I, I know that everybody's going to cringe when I say this. And and I think that um, it's so much like when your pastor talks about tithing, how everybody kind of checks out for a moment. <laughs> and I'm begging you, please don't check out and just listen. But um, we're completely a nonprofit. We do not yeah. receive any money from the government. We do not. None of us are in it for the money. Yeah. Um, you know, we have a shoestring yeah. staff that is doing amazing things and is um, changing the world one overcomer at a time. But um, funding is an issue mm. and we need funding. And I don't like to fear monger or put mm. fear in anyone's heart. But if something happened to somebody you love, a child you loved, yeah. you would want us to be there for them. Right. But we can only be there for them if we receive the money. Mm-hmm. And if you care enough about the victims of trafficking mm. to give. 
Um, I hate talking about money. I hate talking about that aspect because I believe that God will provide. Yeah. But also, God might may provide through the people listening to this podcast sure. and giving them an opportunity to yeah. give and letting them know that how um, vitally important mm-hmm. it is. Because the overcomer that I talked about and how she's receiving her award and she's sober, if we hadn't been there for her, her, I'm not saying she might not have gotten sober, yeah. but her journey would have been that much harder. Right. And if you were like me mm-hmm. and you suddenly self-identified as a victim, you would want us to be there. Mm-hmm. You would want us to be there because it was personal. But trafficking, human trafficking is personal mm-hmm. just because it doesn't affect you personally. It doesn't mean that... It's affecting people that you see every day. It's affecting right. people that you know, but there you just don't hear about it. Yeah. And so the only way for trafficking to, um, for the battle to be fought is for people to care mm-hmm. and to volunteer and to serve. But also sometimes people just need to care mm-hmm. by logging on and making a donation. Mm-hmm. And that's, you don't have to do what I do. Mm-hmm. You don't have to do what y'all do. Sure. Y'all just, you can care. Yeah. And so I think that's um, an important thing to bring up yeah. as much as it's cringy and I don't want to, mm-hmm. but we can only continue to do what we do if people keep the lights on because we do have a facility. We sure. do have a building um, as much as, um, you know, there are people who would vol- are volunteering and would mm-hmm. be in the fight, mm-hmm. but in order to effectively do what we need to do, we have to have that facility. Yeah. And so um, I just want to encourage people to really yeah. ask God what God might have for them in that way mm-hmm. um, and encourage people to sign up for our um, newsletter, mm-hmm. go on our website. My personal testimony was filmed for YouTube a few mm-hmm. months back. And if you go to the handsofjustice.org's website, mm-hmm. um, it's on there and you could watch more about my testimony if you want to um. hear about my story. Um and something I share with people, and I don't, I don't always share it, but I, I am feeling led to do so right now, is um, January 30th, 2023, my sister committed suicide hmm. as a direct result of the traumas that she um, suffered as a child, hmm. that we both suffered as a child. Yeah. And my sister, she broke in a different way than I broke. Um, I was a very broken little child, but she broke differently than I did. Mm -hmm. And she didn't get to find healing and pour into other people. She didn't get to find healing and be the wife and the mother that she wanted to be. She didn't get to find that. Um, And I did, Mm -hmm. and I do. And so I praise God for that, and I'm grateful for that. But people are literally dying in the life and then she'd been out for a long time she was an adult woman yeah but if people don't get the care that they need Mm -hmm. and they don't receive the services that they need this burden can become too heavy to bear yeah and it can become overwhelming yeah and so um i was already in this fight Mm -hmm. before um it happened but now i'm just like Mm -hmm. it's i'm that much more on fire and that much more dedicated because i don't want anybody to end up like my sister yeah i don't want anybody to be alone in their pain and that's something i don't want and that's something hands of justice as an organization doesn't want which is why we support people no whether they're family members they're men or they're women Mm -hmm. um at all stages um and ages we we want to be there for you and hold space and help Mm -hmm. you heal it's incredible thank you for sharing that i'm so sorry for your loss thank you there is no doubt that this issue is life or death Mm -hmm. i mean you've just shared two stories out of i'm sure dozens or hundreds of where i mean it really comes down to life or death Mm -hmm. do we have the resources available do we have the people available and are we willing to meet that need so um Again, they can find you guys at handsofjustice.org. Yes. All the donation portals are there. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you guys have the other information about your resources. And just to be clear for anybody who is in the Houston area, these guys are in Montgomery County. They're kind of on the north side of Houston, but they serve, you guys serve all, the whole nation. We do. Sounds like, yeah. Yes. Yes. We don't 
we don't set a boundary. Yeah. And, yeah. So we support this support groups or mm-hmm. advocacy services, anyone. Um, so we're not just geographical. We mm-hmm. are strategically located in Conroe because there isn't anything up there in that area right. that's anti-trafficking. So we want to be able to serve um, Huntsville and that area as well. Mm-hmm. But we don't we do not um, put any sort of yeah. geographic boundaries on the people that we serve, which is so cool because you doing it by Zoom, you literally can reach. Mm-hmm. I mean, so many people you can just spread and spread and spread and continue to grow that's our hope yeah well carrie it has been such an honor to have you here i hope we get to have you again on our podcast i would love that and thank you for having me and um for giving me this opportunity i'm grateful very very grateful absolutely it's been a joy and an honor Thank you so much for listening and please like and subscribe to the Elijah Rising podcast for more important content just like this. Thank you for joining us today for this episode. If you were inspired by this content today, please share, rate and leave a review. Also, please consider making a donation at ElijahRising.org slash donate. Your support helps us continue the vital mission to combat sex trafficking. Until next time.